full of snake. I'll just pocket it in a minute. I'll go long enough. Uh, I'm glad you're here. We've had some terrible weather this uh, this year. I heard the other day that we've only had two or three weekends since last Labor Day, and uh, that it's not rained. So we're grateful this morning that we do have some uh, good weather. Well, <clears throat> men, next Sunday is Baptist Men's Day. Looking forward to that. All men and boys invited to breakfast about 9.15. Going to have a big breakfast. And then the men are going to fill the choir. And then uh, we have a, a very good speaker. Bill Crane has been a friend of mine for a long, long time. One of the most outstanding laymen I know anywhere. Very committed to his church. And uh, he's going to be speaking for us next Sunday morning. Okay, today's Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. In a little bit... Um, Sibby's going to share us a word. She's been involved in this a long, long time, and she's going to share a word with us about uh, uh, the importance of sanctity of human life. We're going to have prayer in a moment, and I've got something somewhere. People, people give me notes, and then if I don't write them in my little book, I'll usually lose them. Okay. Some of you, I know, got a, got a uh, email from Judy the lady that was with us last year, the lady in Nigeria, y'all remember that? Some of you, huh? Kenya. Kenya. Some of you got an uh, email from her this week, and uh, I want to read that before we, after we have our opening hymn, we're going to have prayer at the altar, and I want to especially uh, read this note to you. Uh, she quoted Psalm 127, which says, unless the Lord watches over the city. The guards watch in vain. And then, then she made this comment. O Lord, watch over my nation and deliver our people from terrorist attacks. Our eyes are on you, O Lord. A uh, number of the African countries are embroiled in civil wars. and The Muslims are very, very prevalent in African countries. And... Uh, they slaughter Christians. I mean, they really, they, they burn a whole church down, like I told you, I think, last Sunday in some of those African countries. I don't know how serious this is, but uh, Mary texted her back and told her that we, uh, and I know some of you responded. Uh, I checked my email and my, my whatever that is. I checked it. So some of you responded. That's what Mary told me. <laughs> Mary responded for all of us and told her that we would certainly be be very mindful of her and uh, her family and her people. Uh, during it. Aren't, aren't we glad that we live in a country where we don't have to fear those things? And I'm glad that you're here this morning. A um, group of our young people, that's why this little section is open this morning at Ridgecrest since this is a holiday weekend and want to keep them in prayer. Uh, Danny, uh, uh, Danny Taylor, Rodney's dad is going to be having surgery uh, you know, he has cancer, and they're going to do surgery on him Thursday at Duke. And uh, we certainly want to keep him in our prayers. Uh, Nell is not doing, she's home from uh, the hospital, but she's not doing well at all. She, she's not in good condition. And I want us to especially remember her in our prayers. Uh, Jerry's having a, uh, Jerry's having a surgery Monday, Monday morning. And uh, I'm going to keep Jerry and Pat in our prayers as he has a... How many of you had, Jerry? You ain't got, no, you ain't got much left, have you? <laughs> it's his heart. He has had a number of surgeries and uh, we want to... So here's what I want to do this morning. <clears throat> Rodney, would you and Carol come down um, to represent your dad? I think it's important to lay hands on people and to pray for them specifically. Uh, Jerry, would you and, uh, and Pat come down this morning? Would uh, one of you... 
Y'all, come on. We're going to sing while y'all are down here. Somebody, who is, who is Nell and Pim's deacon? Okay, you come, Howard's coming down. So, Greg, let's uh, sing and then everybody else can come. And I'm going to ask the deacons to lay hands on these specifically. Anybody else that would want that to happen, please uh, come forward and we'll do it at the same time. Okay? All right. Okay, let's stand together and sing our, our opening song, which is 220, He Is Here. Deacons, deacons, please uh, put hands upon these folks that we're going to pray for this morning. Good that Miss Dale is back. Miss Dale had some uh, heart catheterization done the other day, and so uh, we're so glad she's here this morning. Anybody else need special prayer? Anybody? All right. Oh, I know something I meant to mention. I said I didn't write it. Uh, probably most of you know Dennis Settlemeyer, who ran the Sharon Grill for a long, long time. Had a serious accident several years ago and was burned. Uh, it's a miracle he's alive, and he uh, he passed away uh, sometime last evening. So please keep him and his family, if you would, in, in your in our in your prayers. The psalmist said, "Enter into his gates with thanksgiving." And into his course with praise, be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Scripture also says, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. My, 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 what a privilege. It is without question, Father, the greatest privilege given to mankind. To be able to boldly, as, as, as the writer of Hebrews said, we can, we can come boldly to the throne of grace, grace in prayer. Oh, forgive us, forgive me, Father, for being neglectful at times and just coming into your presence and enjoying your presence. Oh, what a blessing. Just to come and scripture says, wait upon the Lord and he'll strengthen your heart. And Lord, we come this morning as your children. Every day I become more and more thankful for that portion of the model prayer that says, My Father, who art in heaven. My Father. My. A loving Father. A caring Father. A forgiving Father. A merciful Father. A gracious Father. And, and it's to you that we come this morning knowing the scripture says, You're seated at the right hand of the heavenly Father right now making intercession for us hallelujah and that's the spirit in which we come this morning so many requests so many needs there's so much pain there's so much hurt in our world today father probably won't remember all the names but father i want to pray for miss nail this morning she said to me last evening when i spoke with her on the phone i'm very 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 sick bless her and pim this morning he's not here and that's Father, due to the fact that uh, she's probably not doing well at all this morning. So I pray that as we kneel here this morning, as we stand here, I pray that that precious couple would know that there are people who love them and care about them and who are praying for them. Give grace to that entire family. Give it to Joyce and Dorothy and Dan. and Just be with them. Thank you that Miss Dale has gone through her procedure and is doing well. I pray for 
Jerry in the morning, Father, I pray that uh, you'd guide the hand of the surgeon. Uh, I pray for the Settlemeyer family. Uh, uh, Father, I pray for uh, I pray for Danny and his family. Father, they've they've struggled these number of weeks with the idea of this cancer, and now, Father, doctors feel they may be able to accomplish some good by performing surgery upon his body. And I pray that. You'd again guide the surgeon saying, bless the family as they travel back and forth from Duke Hospital. Pray for Miss, uh, I pray for Miss Ruby this morning. They're in the nursing home. I pray for Miss Margie. And Father, somebody I've forgotten, you haven't forgotten them, and I'm thankful for that. This is a, it's so good to be here this morning, to be among the people of God. There's some, Father, that uh, have burdened hearts. There's some who have lost loved ones. There's some who have other family interests this morning, and I pray that you'd bless them. But Lord, I pray more than anything in the world, the Holy Spirit of God would speak to our hearts. My words will fall on deaf ears, lest the Holy Spirit takes my words and relays them to the hearts and minds of your people this morning. Father, thank you for this day that we, we celebrate the fact of millions of, of lives who've been saved from murder. Thank you for those who to stand in the trenches, minister to young ladies who are contemplating taking the lives of their children. Lord bless them. Thank you. Father, as I saw Bruce come down the aisle this morning, I'm reminded that he, like so many fine Christians, serve our state in the legislature. And Lord, they're going to be wrestling with some serious moral issues. I pray you'd give them wisdom, and not only wisdom, courage to stand for what is right. I pray you just bless this service, bless bless. Uh, Greg and Cindy and the choirs they sing this morning. May, may we truly sing forth our praises unto our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And God bless you. singing this morning our next song is learning to lean so let's stand together we're going to sing through this chorus two times learning to lean song, our hymn this morning before our offering is number 52 in your hymnal, and that one is Blessed Be the Name. So let's sing all four verses and then we'll have our offering time.
give us everything we ask and so we need to serve. I just pray that you give to the great conspiracy and the saints of heart, Father, that you tithe and offer that you use the debtors of the kingdom. Lord. <coughs> say a special prayer for those that can't be here this morning, that they want to be, but I also say a special prayer for those that could be and just choose not to. Lord, if, if we could just pray those people in the church, Lord, we would have to have a, a thanksgiving life for them. Um, continue to lift Thomas up in your prayer, his calling to see you, Lord, and lift him up in prayer as he, he goes through these studies and follows you into your calling, Lord, and we just uh, thank you for, for calling him, Lord. Thank you for uh, being here this morning to worship you, Lord, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Quick announcement at the end of our service today, we will have a short business meeting, a quarterly business meeting. Uh, so keep that in mind at the close of the service today. Thank you, Cindy, for playing that. That was beautiful, so we appreciate that. Uh, the choir, for several months now, we've been using, for some of our choir specials, the Dream Song Book. These were given to us by Ellen and her sister Jane in memory of their mom, Nancy. So we certainly got a lot out of them as a choir, and hopefully the songs that you guys have been able to listen to and share with us in worship, that you've received a blessing from those as well. 
from the 104th Psalm, it says, I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God while I live. That's the kind of music that leads to worship. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Shouldn't have to prompt you like that. It's okay. 
God's good. He's worthy to be praised. Amen. All right, Sibby, come on. Today is, in, on the Southern Baptist calendar, today is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. No one's been more involved in that in our church than has Sylvia. She's worked for many years to Palmetto Family Camp, the Family uh, Palmetto Women's Center. Women's Center, they call it now. Yeah. And she's going to give us a few remarks before I come and preach for the next hour. <laughs> Go ahead, Sylvia. Some of them know they're not living like they should, uh, and uh, so we want to help them with, with repentance, or sometimes we get we can pray with them to rededicate their life to Christ. Um, uh, others uh, are, you know, they're married, they're in church, they're active, uh, they're growing in the Lord, and, and we just want to give them encouragement. Uh, so we just want to find where are they, and we want to meet them where they are. Uh, the All of the, the methods have failure rates. And the failure rate that they give you sounds, it can sound just absolutely great. But that's based on uh, perfect laboratory conditions, and they're not testing teenagers. Uh, we know from experience teenagers are very fertile. Uh, they're maybe testing people who are more you know, settled in their 30s, and fertility has kind of gone down by then. Uh, and those, those failure rates are for one year. For instance, if you have five percent failure rate when you multiply it out over ten years almost half so uh, we do not recommend that the only method that is 100 percent is God's method you wait until you get married and so we present we, we present that showing them the advantages to them and to their young men how it's going to advantage them how it's going to advantage uh, 
their future married, marriage if they're thinking of getting married, uh, and then also the disadvantages. Now, the main one everybody focuses on is, is pregnancy. That's not the only risk that, uh, that people encounter when they're not doing things God's way. Uh, STDs, epidemics in this country. Of course, now they call them STIs, and we think it's because they, they figured out that a disease sounds more com uh, a disease sounds more serious than an infection. So they've changed the name so it doesn't sound quite so serious. Uh, and there's broken hearts. We see lots and lots of broken hearts. Uh, one of the things that I tell the young ladies is you can't change the past or the future. You can make the decision right now to become a virgin again in your heart, your mind, and your spirit. And God will honor that and the healing that occurs. Um, uh, and we, uh, it, you know, it, the damage that they do to themselves and well, let me back up a little bit. Sin always damages us. And it damages most of the person that's connected to sin. Uh, but when you when you repent, when you turn to God's way, there's healing that occurs. Um, uh, immorality uh, damages trust and respect in relationships. It damages self-respect. And all of these things will be healed when they make the, de the decision to do things God's way. Uh, okay. Um, for those who have a positive pregnancy test, we offer a free, limited ultrasound. First trimester, we're not diagnosing abnormalities, but we want to see how big is that baby? Uh, you know, how far along uh, is, is this pregnancy? Uh, we want to look at the heart for that. Uh, and uh, we have registered nurses <coughs> who do our ultrasounds. From time to time, we've had volunteers who've been uh, licensed ultrasound technicians, which most are registered nurses, and they've been trained. We send them away for excellent ultrasound training. And because uh, there's always a, another person in the room, and sometimes I've been honored to be the other person in the room doing the ultrasound, and I get to see the ultrasound too, and it's awesome to see those little babies, and you see the little hearts beating, and there are tears and, and joy, and uh, we have uh, been able to change some minds, some hearts and minds, when they can see the truth. We want everything that comes out of our mouths, we want it to be the truth, uh, to, to speak the truth to them. And uh, the ultrasound is certainly a way of seeing the truth about their babies. And uh, we know that uh, the mothers of the babies are uh, about 90% more likely to choose life when they see their babies on ultrasound. Uh, if the father of the baby comes with them and sees that baby, uh, he's up to 98% more likely to choose the life for his child. And so we encourage the young lady, bring the father of the baby with you to the ultrasound appointment. Uh, so uh, anyway, the, uh, yeah, and, and Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And oh boy, is that true. Um, last year I was asked to uh, minister in the area of abortion recovery uh, because we have found abortion to be very, very damaging. And certainly the damage that we deal with is the mental, emotional, and spiritual damage and the distance that it is. Um, abortion wounds the women and the men who are involved. Um, we find that uh, everybody no matter how pro-life or pro-choice they are, you know what abortion does to babies. But what people are not being told is the damage that it does to the mothers and the fathers of the babies. And uh, uh, it, it seriously damages their sense of self-worth. So many, of course, men and women have, I've heard them say, it's like a wall comes down between them and God. They can't get away from God constantly. And I think this is one of the factors in our modern society that is causing people to flee the church. Uh, they don't feel comfortable around God. Uh, I've had one woman tell, tell me, I don't think God will ever forgive me. And uh, so, um, they and they seem to get stuck in the angry stage of grief. Um, a lot of depression, depression, a lot of them are on antidepressants. Um, they, a lot of them struggle with substance abuse. Everybody's different. Not everybody's gonna be 
all of them. Uh, the suicide rate is very high for both the men and the women, you know, significantly higher than the general population. So we're going to help them with the secrets that they've been carrying, that have been eating at them, the guilt, uh, forgiveness. This is something that doesn't just involve one person. There's a lot of people that need to be forgiven. Um, their anger, and we provide a safe place for them to grieve the loss of their child. Like one woman said to me, there's no casket, there's no grave, there's no funeral. The world never allows you to grieve the loss of your child. And, and so right now, it's like getting a tooth pulled, um, and uh, you'll get over it. But they can't. And so we want to help them with it. And at the very end, we, at the end, we have a memorial service, the memorial service for their children that they didn't get to have uh, earlier. And uh, we want to give them a new identity as a shining child of God, a shining sister in Christ. Uh, just the, oh, you know, I left my Bible out in my car, but the power of God's word to heal hearts. This is a Bible study. It is so compelling. It is so nice. Written by a woman who had had an abortion and God had healed her heart, and she wanted to share that healing with all the other wounded uh, women out there. Um, we have male volunteers who can take a man, who can have a man uh, take a man through that healing, but the power of God's word to heal. Uh, no matter what your burden is, God heals. He wants to heal your heart. Thank you. pro-life message is one that uh, today is not, uh, not spoken very loudly in a lot of our churches, sad to say. Uh, I thank God that I had the privilege of pastoring a group of people who are pro-life. I have been that way for a long time, had many experiences. The big pro-life rally in Washington on Friday uh, drew 100,000 plus people. There was a pro-life rally in Columbia yesterday, and I don't know how many people uh, that rally attracted. Uh, in years gone by, Mary and I have attended. Uh, when you get a little older, and usually it's cold in January, and you have to walk uh, that distance from the university uh, to the state capitol. It just gets... Uh, a little rough on older people, but I have attended in the past, and there's always been a great number. I will say this, and this is not a political statement, but I will say that uh, at the rally on Friday, uh, uh, Vice President Pence and his wife spoke in Washington on Friday. President Donald Trump has done more for the pro-life movement than any president. In, in the, in the uh, withdrawing funds from uh, the abortion clinics and government and so forth. And so we are grateful, despite the dysfunction of the government, there is some progress. Uh, you read the numbers, and I, I read something this past week that surprised me a little. Actual numbers of abortion has decreased, but it doesn't tell the whole story. I did not know that some states no longer report to the CDC their abortions. Among them is the state of California, which is probably the largest state where abortion is performed. So we don't think the numbers as low today as they say it is, because California and several other states no longer report their numbers to the CDC. Thank God for folks like Sibia and many others, uh, you know, who, who are working in that, in that field. You know what that means? You know what that means? What does that mean? No. If you read an article somewhere and you see that, what what does it what does it tell you? It's a quote. So my sermon's a quote this morning. You'll not hear anything that you haven't heard a thousand times. As I have worked on this message for a couple of weeks, it ties into last Sunday's message. Uh, the Lord really impressed me with the fact that I can stand up here, jump up and down, hoop and holler, run up and down the aisle, but unless the Holy Spirit convinces you of what I'm saying this morning, it'll all be in vain. So Holy Spirit, 
thou art welcome. I welcome in this place this morning to come and to fill my heart and my mind and my lips with your word. Your word, not my words. And I'm thankful that as a servant of God that I can stand behind the sacred desk of God and share the word of God. Share probably one of the most important messages could be shared from any pulpit today. And so Holy Spirit, come and you not only fill me, but I pray that you would speak, speak, speak expressly to every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. This you've heard. This past uh, Wednesday, I think it was, some of you probably saw it on the news, was the 10th anniversary of the miracle on the Hudson. I don't see that. And it was a miracle. One thing is I was watching one of the newscasts the other day was a lady who was on that plane. And her testimony was this. And I'm not saying I've got it exactly correct, but I think pretty much so. She said when we realized when we realized the plane was going down and we realized that there was probably imminent death for all of us, she said we began to cry. Any of you see that? That particularly caught my attention. Listen to me very carefully. What does this say to you about most people's idea of prayer? This is important. What does her statement say to you about most people's idea of prayer? Until there is an emergency. And then we pray. Somebody has described prayer as being like a spare tire. When do you use a spare tire? When you got four good tires on, you just decide, oh, I just want to change one of them out. Well, them little bubble balloons that you put on things today, you ain't got much to change out. Like a spare tire is something that you, that you use only in case of an emergency. It is that idea of prayer, maybe, that keeps many a child of God from seriously engaging in prayer. I believe with all of my heart this morning, unless the people of God, you and I, get energized to pray, we don't have a lot of hope. I know what Second Chronicles, I know what it was intended to. It was intended to speak to the people of Israel when they had drifted away from God. And God said, if my people... Called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land. I know to whom it was addressed, but I believe with all my heart, and I'm not the only person who believes this. I believe that same principle applies to any nation on the face of the earth that has drifted away from God and returns to God. God will bless those people. I believe that. Now, I'm all, gosh, there's so much here. We talked a little about this last week. When I talked to you about the two most serious internal problems in the church, one was the unregenerate church membership, and second was the fact that the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, said, your, your problem is the reason there are divisions among you I won't quote all of that, but Paul said the reason for all of this dissension and division is because you're still acting like immature spiritual children rather than grown-up adults in the faith. Now, I still believe that. I believe those two things are very prevalent today. I believe that we, we have to... Gosh. Let me go back to 7, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen real quickly. 
God said you'll have, you'll have to humble yourself before you pray. A, pride, a prideful people will not pray. And there is pride rampant across America today. It's rampant in the church. It's rampant in the government. It's rampant in our homes. And until we can realize, friend, we need God. You need God from the time you get up in the morning until the time you go to bed at night. Now, I'll talk briefly about that this morning, but you need God. There's so many invitations. And boy, they, you know, God has invited us to enter into his presence. I love what Hebrews says, as, as, as I spoke in, in, in my prayer this morning. It says, come boldly. Boldly. You don't have to be timid about entering into the presence of God. Just come boldly. And God will treat you with respect and God will hear you and God will answer your prayers. One of my favorite verses of late has been that passage over in, uh, over in the Old Testament when, uh, when God said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great, great and mighty things that you've never seen before. Beloved, if we need to see miracles, we need, if, we, if we really need to see miracles, we need to see them today. When I was reading Yesterday, just sitting there reading the Gospels and reading about the ministry of Jesus on this earth. And, 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 and one passage I read said that uh, Jesus healed all who came to him. It talks about him healing the lepers. It talks about him healing the demoniacs. And I, I could not help but say, but oh, God, that's what we need to see today that people might know that God is real. God can do those things. Jesus is no less, this thought came to my mind, Jesus is no less limited in what he can do today than what he was able to do when he walked this earth. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. Jesus is no less limited in what he can do today than what he did when he walked this earth. So let's see how far we can get in these next uh, 35 minutes. Uh, Peter said, the, Peter spoke these words. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. I know that specifically talking about the sufferings of Jesus. But there are other indications in the Bible that Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, is to be our example in all things that we do. In fact, the Bible says that we are to be constantly conformed under the image of Jesus Christ. We are to be becoming more like Jesus. Are, are we? Yeah. We ought to be. Whether we are or not, we ought to be. And Jesus gave us, Jesus gave us an example. We talked about this some last week. That's why I'm saying to you, I'm repeating some things I, was, I said last time and many other times. Uh, Bruce, you'll appreciate this. I was in an educational course at, uh, It wasn't upstate South Carolina then. It was uh, some other name. But uh, over in Spartanburg, I was taking an educational course. And uh, I don't remember a thing else the professor said. But he said this one thing I've never forgot. He said to those of you who teach, he didn't say whether in the church or in the school. He was specifically talking about the school, but the same idea holds true in the church. If you're going to teach people anything, you teach them by repetition. You say the same thing again and again and again, and if there's anything I could leave Union Baptist Church, it'd simply be this. Become more than, become a people, a church of prayer, more than anything else in the world. 
become a people of prayer. Follow, follow the example of Jesus. Uh, several scriptures, and I can't read all of them that I've written down here. But Matthew 14, 23 says, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, and when the evening came, Jesus was alone. Scholars believe this, and you've heard me say this. At the habit of Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, his habit was to get up early every morning and to spend those first hours of any day in communion with the Heavenly Father. One of the mistakes that people make about prayer is they don't even understand what prayer is. If we were to go through this congregation this morning and I were to ask you, well, just simply tell me, what do you believe prayer is? I'd probably get about as many answers as there are people here this morning. And you've heard me say this. I learned it from our Love to Pray book many years ago, back many years ago before we came here. Best definition of all that I've ever heard, that prayer is a conversation between two people who love each other. Prayer is a conversation. Most of us view prayer as simply in a time of crisis or time of emergency running into the presence of God and saying, oh God, we've got a crisis on our hands. My son, my daughter's come addicted to drugs. I've just been notified I have cancer. I've just heard that my husband's walked away from me. I've just heard that I lost my job and, and so with most of us, that's the concept of prayer. And so we're running to the presence of God. And we say, now God, here's my list. Please listen. Would you please pay attention to what I'm saying? That, my, that, my beloved friend, is not biblical idea of prayer. If prayer is a conversation between two people who love each other, it, it includes my talking to God. Amen. Do you know what else it includes? God speaking. And you have to wait. We don't have to, hey, listen, man, I, I ain't got time to wait on God to speak to me. I, I've told him what I want, what I need. Man, I got to get up and go. I can't wait two seconds at a red light until it turns green. <laughs> I can't even wait five seconds at a, at a McDonald's drive through before they give me my food. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? We're, we're a society of people who want everything instantly. God has no obligation whatsoever to speak to you or me instant. What God wants more than anything else is God wants my attention. And you know what that may take? It may take 30 minutes of sitting still in the presence of before you ever hear one word from God. People tell me, Preacher, I, I don't understand you. You're always telling us about, well, God said this, God said that, God said the other. God never said anything to me. Boy, I'd be seriously checking up on my life. You mean, you mean God speaks to you every time you speak to him? No. <laughs> oh, no. But, but the times that God has really spoken to me have been the times that I have sat still. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Be still. And know I am God. Wait on me. If it takes 30 minutes, it's 30 minutes. In the process of that 30 minutes, I'm going to tell you something God will do to you. God may give you a message for yourself. But God may do something else. God may put somebody's name on your heart to pray for and you don't even know why. Rarely does a day go by that one of your names doesn't pop up in my mind when I'm having that time of just simply waiting on God. And I don't even know why. I just say, God, you know, Spirit's working. 
whatever you need to do. The most valuable time of your day is the time that you spend with God. And I'm not convinced that most Christians follow Jesus' example. Let me say something else. And I, I, I can't get through all these notes, but let me tell you something else. You cannot separate prayer from this book. This book and prayer are like Siamese twins. If you're going to get the greatest value out of both of them, you have to, you have to join them together. Again, your time. Uh, I know many of you have uh, the Blackaby Devotion book and had, had, had one or two wonderful, wonderful devotions this week about prayer. Use a devotional book, but also use the Word of God. Real quickly, and I'm going to give these to you. What? Oh, please give me five minutes. Um, disciples of Jesus, they listened to the greatest preacher who ever lived. His name was Jesus. They watched the greatest miracle worker who ever walked the earth perform miracles. And they came to him one day and said, Master, we've heard you preach. We heard the Sermon on the Mount. We heard you preach on other occasions. We heard you, we heard you launch out into the, uh, into the Sea of Galilee and stand there in the boat because the crowds so thronged you. And we listened to you preach. Would you pre please give us a seminar 101 on preaching? You know, they never asked him to show us how to preach. Never said show us how to work miracles. But they came to him one day after observing his life and the power that he exhibited. And they said, Master, would you teach us to pray? And he gave the model prayer. It's not the Lord's Prayer. People get that. I don't know where, where that ever started. The Lord's Prayer is in John 17 when he prays for his disciples and us. So say with me, My Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is the greatest format given to man as to how his prayer life should evolve. There is is something else, and some of you are familiar with it, some of you may not be. They're hand in hand. It says the same thing. Acts, A-C-T-S. This this has helped me a lot through the years. A stands for adoration. The first thing that you ought to do when when you begin your prayer time is just simply adore the Lord. I, 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 most of the time I just I sit there and, and the Lord begins to give me a hymn holy 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 Lord God almighty early in the rest of it sometimes you say praise the Lord you know what the Lord ain't never struck me down yet I raise my hands and I say, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, just praise him. He, if you get no further in your prayer life than in your prayer time than just simply praise him, folks, I'm going to tell you something. You'll feel better. I thank Greg for that song this morning, one of my favorites for years. Learning to lean, learning to lean. I'm learning to lean. Jesus. Sometimes I sing that because, boy, I have learned the last year and a half to lean on Jesus. On and on. A, adoration. C, confession. Now, Lord, if I've made some mistakes in the last couple of days, please forgive me, though. That ain't what he's talking about. (laughs) He's talking about being specific about sins that you've committed. In fact, the Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. We know to pray, and if we don't pray, it 
is sin. Thanksgiving. Oh, he stayed all day just giving him thanks. Supplications, praying for. Let me tell you the best time to start your prayer time every day. Don't get out of bed until you first of all pray. When my eyes open, usually it's cocoa that makes my eyes open. Cocoa's ready to go out. <laughs> well, that's my signal. So I just I just start thanking the Lord and praising the Lord and. and I mean, it's, 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 it's awesome. It's a relationship. You don't have to be talking. Me and I sit there sometimes. Me and I'll sit there sometimes in our two recliners side by side. And we'll just sit there for 15 or 20 minutes. Listen, let me tell you something. If you love somebody, one of the greatest joys of your life is to be with them. If you love Jesus, the greatest joy of your life will be with Jesus. All right. Uh, well, all these other important things. Uh, all these other important things I've written down, I'll have to save for another day. I, I'm going to tell them to you real quickly. Um, and then we'll talk about them someday. First of all, you have to be convinced you're responsible to pray before you'll ever pray. And only the Holy Spirit can convince you of that. I can't. You have to understand the true nature of prayer, and I've tried to briefly talk about that this morning. You have to be willing to follow the example of Jesus. And you have to be willing to discipline yourself to do what we talked about this morning. I'll tell you something. How many of you believe America is headed in the right direction? How many of you believe America is heading in the right direction? Do you, if you do, raise your hand. <laughs> well, if we don't think it's headed in the right direction, why don't we pray about it? How many of you think the church in general is headed in the right direction? I talked to a man last evening. It's very untypical. I said, how many of y'all running your church? And this was over in Indian land. I said, how many, how many on, on, on an average do you run in your church on Sundays? He said, 30,000. 30,000. That is eight, That is not typical. The average Southern Baptist church runs less than 100 people. About 50 people do that on this week. Church is not well. Are our families well? No. Our sons and daughters well? No. On and on and on you can go. If you want, if you want a reason to pray, just stop and think clearly what we need to pray about. We're going to sing a song and then we'll have our business conference. Greg's going to come and lead us and sing that old, old, old song. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour. I hope, I hope, I hope, I pray that you will take to heart every word I've spoken this morning because I believe it's from the Word of God. Nothing, nothing can excel the importance of prayer. So let's stand and sing it and then we'll be seated. And, okay? Two verses, it's number 640, Sweet Hour Prayer. Let's stand and sing together. 640 in your hymnal. <laughs>
passage yeah. there. But uh, Bob, if you would, a couple others put or get some passed out the uh, financial statements. We'll consider ourselves in uh, conference this morning. It should not take long. Um, Bobby, you got anything to say about the Sunday school while they're passing this out and folks are taking a look at it? You got a word for us from Sunday school? You got anything you want to say about Sunday school? Sure. Go ahead. Okay, amen. Uh, Michael Deacon's got any matters? Uh, Lee, y'all have anything? Okay. Greg, Greg's chairman of finance. Okay, the, the, hopefully all of you that, that would like one have a financial statement in front of you. Uh, Susan did a little different format this time, which is hope, hopefully a little easier to understand that first page. Uh, you see it's a balance sheet, and you see of all the assets, all the contributions that we've had, and other things in the last quarter. Uh, as of right now, our total assets are uh, $355,647. And of course, that's down from the previous quarter because we took uh, 80 something thousand to purchase the house next door to our property. So we're a little bit off from what we were before, but clearly that's the reason uh, for that. If you go to the second page and beyond, you see the budgeted expenses uh, for this year to date and for the, uh, the current period, the current quarter that ended December 31st. You also see the, the missions, uh, mission expenses there as well. And if you go far, far enough in the report, which I think that's probably our designated income, you see one example, Lottie Moon offering, we exceeded our goal by a good bit. It was over $7,000. I think that's already been reported. But does anybody have any specific questions about any of our expenses or income in the last quarter? Anybody? Questions, comments? All right. Any? We are we are well financially, but uh, uh, as the church moves on, uh, uh, I'll say this so you'll understand it. Um, I hope today, I hope when Mom and I leave, and you need to be praying about the next person God brings you, <coughs> you, uh, you will inevitably have to pay them more than you pay me. You've been very generous to me, and I appreciate that. If you call a young pastor with a family, he would need to be paid more than you're able to pay me or you're paying me. And that means that everybody needs to step up in their giving. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it's sin. 
If you know the Bible teaches you ought to tithe and you don't tithe, that's sin. And one of the things I did not get around to mentioning in the sermon, the one thing that will hinder your prayer life more than anything else is disobedience to God and His Word. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Bible says God will not hear me. I just, I encourage you, there's a blessing in giving. There's a blessing in giving. The more you give, the more you will experience the blessings of God. That doesn't mean materially. I'm not one of those guys that believes. I hear these television people, well, send me $1,000 and God's going to give you a new pink Cadillac. That's a lie from hell. That ain't going to happen. But God will bless you with the inner peace that you cannot experience any other way. We are well financially. Few churches our size are able to say they have this kind of money in the budget. But uh, there are a lot of needs. Anybody else? Anything else? Bring my attention. Anything? Don't forget about your men and boys. Next Sunday is going to be a great, great day with our Baptist Men's Day. I want all the men and boys to be here and join us. Okay, let's stand for our closing prayer. And I'm going to ask Michael to lead us in prayer. And then Greg will lead us in singing our closing hymn. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for a sweet spirit that's in this church. We thank you for no strife, no envy at the moment, things that could really cause conflict and cause issues within the church. We have a sweet spirit here. We thank you very much for that. We know that you are still on the throne, Lord. Everything that we do, help us, guide us, give us wisdom, give us direction that we might honor you with, with everything, with our tithes, with our offerings, with our business. Everything that we do, that this church might be a light to, to, to a community that would show others the way to Christ. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our closing song. He is here. Mm -hmm.